Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a reparenting series, which brought us to learning to have friendships and be a good friend, and what that led us to this little mini series on relationships. And I want to wrap that up today. And we've been talking about conflict, and I want to wrap that up and then add a few things further about relationships. One of the things that is so important to understand with conflict is it's not just that you have a good start and that you process the conflict well, it's really important that you end a conflict well. And that's what I want to focus at right now. So we, we saw really three goals that you have as you deal with conflict. The number one is not to win, it's to clearly understand each other. Then the second is <clears throat> to process it well, hopefully so that you can resolve it. And now the third is to end it well. And that really means to learn from it so that you get to the end of the conflict and you go, okay, what did we do well? What could we have done better? What did we learn about this issue as we've discussed it? All of that just helps you grow in doing conflict well. And so let me just give you some of the tools that are helpful for people when they come to the end of a conflict, let's say it's been resolved, but now they review how the conflict went. So first thing that you can do is for each person to take a turn to talk about their perspective on how it went. And you just listen, and they can say, yeah, I thought it went really well, or I thought it went well here, but here I, I, I got a little uncomfortable. Just open talk about it. Then go to, okay, what emotions did you feel during the conflict, and talk about that. And then validate each other on what you did well, what points you made that were really good. And then validate each other about how you're evaluating the conflict so that you go, wow, yeah, I never saw that about how we go about conflict. That, that, we should improve that. That's a great point. And then talk about anything that triggered you while you were in the conflict. And that can be some great discussions will come out of that. Make sure you accept and own your part for anything that wasn't done well in the conflict. So if you got emotionally dysregulated, if you got a little bit disrespectful, if you deflected or minimized your part, own that stuff. And then you want to come to, okay, what could we do better next time? What could we do differently that would improve how we go about conflict? Having said that, it's really important to factor in something to talk about as you're reviewing the conflict. So if you're feeling the conflict didn't go well and that you were really uncomfortable, it could really be from two possible sources. Number one, it could be because the other person didn't do something well, they said something that was hurtful or misleading or gaslighting, or it could be something from your past was triggered. And so you could be uncomfortable in the conflict, but the conflict really has gone really well. The reason for your discomfort is not something that was done wrong in the conflict. The reason for your discomfort is it triggered some of your stuff. And so think of it this way. You could be going, during this conflict, I felt excluded. Now that could be because they were dominating conversation and not letting you talk, or that could be because in the past, whenever there was a conflict, you always felt excluded. And now in this conflict, it just triggered that. So if you're feeling excluded, make sure you consider, did that actually happen in this conflict, or was it really something from my past that got triggered? Another one that can come up is, I didn't feel like I was important in this conversation. Is that actual fact, or is that something from your past that got triggered? Or, in this conflict, all of a sudden, I just felt emotionally cold. 
Now, is that because of something your partner did? Or is that because that was a survival skill from your past during a conflict? You shut down emotionally. Or, I felt strongly rejected. Now, is that because they did reject you? Or is that because whenever anybody disagreed with you in the past, that's you interpreted as rejection? So those become important things to consider. Next one would be, I felt like I was being criticized all the time. Now, that could actually have happened, or that could be some of your stuff from the past that isn't actually the truth about this current conflict. Or I felt like you had no affection to me. You just seemed angry, cold, hard. Is that actual? Is that your past? I felt like you weren't attracted to me. I felt like you weren't hearing me. I felt like I was being bullied. I felt I couldn't persuade you at all. It was like arguing with a rock. I felt disrespected, I felt judged, I felt shamed, I felt powerless, I felt out of control, I felt blamed for everything. So a very fruitful discussion afterwards, after a conflict, is if you felt any of those things is to say, okay, did that actually happen or is this from my past and I need to talk about it and look at it. There's another thing that's important to discuss after the fact. And it's, what did you need during the conflict? So conflicts are always stressful. Conflicts always kind of push us to a very uncomfortable place. So what could I have given you in the conflict that would have helped you? What did you need? And so this is where you can discuss, you know what, during this conflict, I needed to know periodically during the conflict that you were really listening to me. That would have helped me. Or during the conflict, I needed to just have you do things that made you feel you were being patient as I was struggling with some of the slowness of the process or getting where you were at. I needed to sense that you were being patient. Or, I needed assurances that you weren't going to overreact if I said something that was maybe con confrontational. Or, I needed you just once in a while to stop the conflict and say, just want you to know we're on the same team, I love you. Or, I needed you to have a sense once in a while or be open to the idea that I just once in a while need to break from talking and then we'll come back to it but let's just take a break so th that becomes important or I just needed you to validate me regularly whenever you agree with my point of view do more than nod just go yeah that's a really good point D that would really help me in a conflict or I just needed to know and feel that even though we're arguing, you're still respecting me. Or I needed it be more about right, wrong, who's right, who's wrong. I needed to also feel empathy and support as we go through this. I needed an emotional warmth to be part of important things for every couple, friends, to talk about after a conflict so they're always growing. Now, there's one issue that comes out of conflict that we need to talk about. Researchers have found that couples resolve about 70% of their conflicts in the moment that they're having a discussion. That means that some of the conflict isn't resolved right away, but it will be resolved over the next weeks and months as, as they keep working on it. But there is the reality that some conflict, you discuss it, you do it all well, it still isn't resolved. There's a gridlock, is the term I'm going to use. So that's a reality for relationships. You want to resolve it, but you realize that some things, not many, but some things won't be resolved either today 
or maybe ever. You hit a gridlock. So here are the characteristics of gridlock. Number one, you've had the same argument again and again with no resolution. So you keep trying, but you just get no further. Secondly, you get to a point where you can no longer address this issue with humor, empathy, or affection. There's just a, an anger, a coldness, a frustration that's now present whenever this issue comes up. Thirdly, this issue is now increasingly polarizing as time goes by. Fourth, compromise seems impossible because to give in seems you'd be selling out. You'd be giving up something important, something core to your beliefs, your values, your sense of self. So you just can't give in. So if those four things are true, then you've reached gridlock. So what were the causes of that? So let me just give those again, or let me summarize those. Number one, you can reach a gridlock when you b realize that both, you have both sets of dreams that are going in different directions. So you see their dreams, but that, they're not your dreams. You don't want those dreams. You don't respect those dreams. You might even feel that those dreams go against your values or they're not even realistic. They're based on foolish childhood fantasies. And so you just hit this gridlock where you're not going in the same direction. Secondly, you can have other core beliefs and values that could be political, could be religious, spiritual, cultural, and you just are not willing to give those up and your partner's on a different page and you don't know how to resolve it. Or there could be something about their personality and you academically know maybe they really can't change that a whole lot, but you just refuse to accept it. And, and so you argue about it, you complain about it, but nothing changes and you can't come to accept that about them. Or you've never been taught the tools to resolve really tricky situations. You haven't learned the wisdom to do that. And so you hit tricky situations and you just hit this grit roadblock, impasse. You can't get by it because you don't know how. Or you could have complex trauma issues that have never been resolved that cause the gridlock. So if you've got shame issues that have never been resolved, then there's some issues you're never going to be able to resolve just by conflict, discussion. They're only going to be resolved if you heal your shame. But if your shame hasn't been healed, you're going to always have a gridlock. Other one is if you grew up in complex trauma and all your thinking is black and white, rigid thinking, there's no gray, there's no give, you're going to hit gridlocks and, and you're not going to be able to get past it because you can't change black and white, your black and white thinking. So those are some of the causes for why gridlocks happen, why we can't get past them. So what do we do about it? Well, let me give you some tools for living with gridlock that I hope will help, help you. What I think is important for couples to realize is in some cases, it's okay not to agree. It's okay to be in a gridlock. You, you can live a very happy life with some issues that you just don't agree on. So take, for example, COVID vaccines. Your partner might be for it, you might be against it. Politics. You might vote for one party, your partner votes for another. All of those things you can learn to live with. You can learn to be a happy relationship that those are just topics that you just do not agree on. And so what you have to do then as a couple is realize, okay, this isn't about right or wrong, winning or losing, 
we might want to frame it that way and make it that way, but <clears throat> we can agree to disagree. So we're going to do two things. Number one, every once in a while, we're going to come back and discuss it, but we're not going to discuss it regularly because to discuss it regularly only causes conflict and anger and that if we just do it too much, it could begin to cause us to lose respect for each other and it could be a negative thing in our relationship. So we're, we're not going to talk about it regularly. It's kind of off limits, but we will come back occasionally to discuss it. When we do, the point of the discussion is not winning or losing. The point of the discussion is to see where we're at and to be respectful to each other. We are not going to go to, you disagree with me, now I'm going to punish you for that. Now I'm going to try to manipulate you to agree with me. No, we're going to maintain a very respectful attitude toward each other. But then every gridlock situation, it comes to deal breaker or not deal breaker types of things. So you might be able to say, you know what, I can live that we disagree about the COVID vaccine. I can live with that. That's not a deal breaker. But if you don't set boundaries with your family, which is toxic, and you keep doing that and letting them influence you and hold you back and cause issues in our relationship, in my mind, that's a deal breaker. Now, in others, they might say, no, that's not a deal breaker. We can learn to live with that. So every couple, when it comes to gridlock, has to go to, is this a deal breaker or not? And if it's not a deal breaker, then you go, okay, what are the boundaries then we're going to have? So we're not going to talk about COVID vaccine. Maybe once a year we'll bring up the topic. Or, okay, I can tolerate your family, but you need some boundaries with them. So we're going to have some boundaries in place around this. Or you can't stand my driving, so how are we going to live with that? What are the boundaries we're going to put in place around driving? And so you work through all of those things which are all basically boundaries, negotiations, give and take, in order to find a way to live with this issue that you can't resolve without destroying the relationship. But there will be some issues that are deal breakers. That's where you have to be able to go Okay, I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that this is a deal breaker until we've tried a whole bunch of different things. And then we've tried to solve it in many ways. We've got outside help to try and solve it, but if it's still not resolvable and it's causing major issues, then it's a deal breaker. We need to look at how we're going to terminate this relationship. So those are gridlock issues. They're tough issues. No couple likes to have to deal with them, but they are a reality for so many people when it comes to having a healthy relationship. So that wraps up the conflict part. Now I just want to go to two other things about relationships. So the first I want to give you is just really practical warning signs that something's off in the relationship. Now, sometimes things are off in a relationship just because of current circumstances. And once you get through those circumstances, things will go back. And so it's just a little bump in the road. But other times things are off because something is wrong. Something needs to be addressed quickly and fixed. So what are some signs that things might be off, that trouble might be brewing? Number one is... Both of you, or one of you, is acting more irritable. Good warning sign. Second, one or both of you are feeling a lot of anger. More anger than normal. So it's not just irritability, it's more lash outs. Third one, you're, one of you or both of you are just feeling a little bit emotionally distant, not connected. Fourth one, there's tension. You feel the tension. Something's 
come between us. Something's troubling us. Fifth one, you feel your partner isn't as emotionally available to you. You want to talk, they just aren't available or interested. Sixth one, there's part of you that just would prefer to be in a different room than your partner, to be somewhere else. You just aren't enjoying spending time with them. Or, next one, you start to just feel lonely within the relationship. That's an important one. Or you feel like you're just out of touch with each other. You're losing touch with each other. How they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're dreaming. Then, both of you, or one of you, has been under a lot of stress, and you're starting to see it's taking its toll. Less patience, more anxiety, obsessive thoughts, all of those things, warning signs. Part of you just longs for your partner, wishes you could be closer. That's a, a warning sign that something could be off. Or you just want to be alone a lot. You want to isolate, actually, from your partner. Or you're with your partner, but their attention always seems to be elsewhere. They're distracted by everything, and you don't get their full attention. Or you just got this list of things in your mind that you want to talk about, and you get to the point where you go, we really need to talk. That could be a warning sign. Or you realize that you've made some attempts to talk, but all of a sudden you're not communicating very well. You're misunderstanding each other. You're not taking the time to explain. That can be a warning sign. Or you just find that you're fighting more than usual, and that little wee things you, you complain about, and then they escalate into a fight. And so there's all this escalation and more fighting than usual. And then you notice that you're hurting each other's feelings more than normal. And that leads to the relationship isn't as much fun as it has been. There's not as much joy from being together and connecting. It seems that the relationship, there's tension, there's problems, there's irritability, there's fighting. It, it's just, it's got a negative flavor to it now. Or you just find that one of you is quite cold when it comes to giving physical affection. So 20 different warning signs that something may be off. Now the danger is to jump to, on the very first day that you see that warning sign to jump to, oh, we're falling apart and go to worst case scenario. If you see a warning sign, just pay attention to it and monitor it over the next couple of days. And if it continues and gets a little bit worse, then you can start to go, I think we need to talk about this. So what causes relationships to begin to drift, to have trouble brewing. Let me give you six things. First would be, one or both of you are just overtired. And when you're overtired, you just need to take care of yourself if you're ever gonna be able to love somebody else. You, you just don't have the energy to meet the needs of the other person and of the relationship. So being overtired is a, common cause in our busy culture and it points to we need to learn self-care better. We need to adjust our schedules so we get more rest. A second cause is if you're in a relationship where your needs are not being met and you go for a period of time where your needs are not being met, that's going to cause you to change your feelings, to be irritated with your partner. It might happen at a subconscious level, but it could be one of the causes for trouble brewing is your needs or their needs are not being met the way they should be. Third one is whenever our stress systems are activated, and it could be from outside things, work, children, just frustrations with finances, whatever, whenever our stress systems are activated, it tends to put a, a stress on the relationship. It tends to cause us to go more into survival mode, which affects how we relate each other, 
and it causes us to begin to have trouble brewing. Another one is if there's mental health issues involved. So depression and anxiety, if they're starting to happen in one, one partner's life or both lives, that can then cause the relationship to not be as close, to not connect as well, to be more irritable. So that could be an issue. If there's an unresolved hurt that you haven't resolved, that you haven't talked about, that can brew, become a resentment, and then that causes trouble to brewing. The sixth one I think is so important to understand. If you come out of complex trauma, understand that you have a default setting based on what your normal was as a child. What your normal was regarding relationships, what your normal was regarding your own emotional world. And so what many people from complex trauma have as their default setting, their autopilot, their normal, is disconnection. Not being present to the other person. Dissociated. And so without realizing it, you can be in a relationship and just slide back into your default setting because that feels normal and comfortable. You go there subconsciously and all of a sudden... You're not present. You're disconnected. Or you could have a default setting where you just slide into being negative and critical in your thinking and you find fault with everything. Or you could have a default setting of shame. And so you just go to, I want to hide. I want to people please. I don't want to set boundaries. I don't want to talk about myself and be vulnerable. All of those, all of those default settings, if you go into them, they're going to start to cause problems in your relationship. So be aware of those things. So if you realize that something's not right, something's brewing, there's starting to be tension, there's starting to be distance, what do you do? So like I said in the beginning, bite your tongue. Don't just react and don't go to worst case scenario. Just watch it for a little bit. And that means also that you bite your tongue when you feel irritated, when you, the other person's irritated with you, you don't respond to that, you bite your tongue because that only makes things worse. Then once you realize, okay, we're drifting, <clears throat> we're closing our hearts to each other, consciously make a decision. We're going to move towards each other. We don't feel like it necessarily, but we're going to choose to open our hearts. We're going to choose to push past the uncomfortable feelings and open up to each other. And we're going to choose to share. We're going to choose to be vulnerable. We're going to choose intimacy. And what happens is, is you're not allowing your limbic brain to pull you towards survival mode. But you're choosing to use healthy tools of intimacy, of healthy relationships, and you're choosing to do them even though you don't feel like it. And what often happens is as you choose to do that, you connect. And as you connect, all of that other stuff begins to disappear, and pretty soon the warm feelings start to come back. So there's times in a relationship when you feel yourself drift, drifting but your emotions are negative that you have to choose to move towards each other which means going against your emotions until your emotions catch up. And part of it is good communication of being able to talk about how you're doing, how things are going and then appreciating each other. Not focusing just on negatives, but learning to value and appreciate each other. So every relationship will struggle with times, and they could happen fairly regularly, where you start to drift. And at first you don't even realize it. Then you see warning signs. Once you see warning signs, you monitor it, then what do you do? Figure out a way to move back to connect again. 
And that doesn't feel comfortable. That feels awkward. That feels weird. But you choose to do the healthy tools and bring it back on course. Now, let me end with this. We've talked about in the past different types of intimacy. Intellectual intimacy, sexual, physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, spiritual intimacy. And what we've tried to show is what makes a relationship strong is that core intimacy or what I would call spiritual intimacy. And I don't mean religion in that. What I mean is where you're on the same page as far as core beliefs, core values, core dreams. That's, you're, you're together. Your hearts beat together. You share a similar fire in your core. That is the core of the foundation of a healthy relationship is that spiritual core intimacy. And so it becomes important to think about how do I build intimacy at that core level? Yes, it's great to have emotional intimacy, sexual intimacy, all those things are great. But if you don't have the core spiritual intimacy, all of that stuff doesn't hold a relationship together. It's got to start at the core. So I want to give you four things that help build core spiritual intimacy, shared meaning. So number one are rituals that you can do together. So a ritual is basically a structured routine that you share together. And so you can think of it as eating meals together, a game night together, Christmas together, going to church together, going on hikes together, Thanksgiving, whatever. Those can all be rituals. The tricky part about rituals is we tend to just make it about, let's just do this activity. So we're going to eat together every night. There's no value in just eating together if you don't connect. So the point of a ritual is a shared activity that leads to connection. It's all about connection not just the activity. And so make sure when you go to do an activity that you discuss, okay, is this going on a hike, having a games night, is that meaningful to you? Is that meaningful to me? Okay, it is, but let's make it about, we want it to lead to connection. So let me give you a question air just to help you see where you're at as a couple regarding rituals together. So we see eye to eye about the rituals that involve family dinner time in our home. Number two, we see eye to eye about holiday meals, about holidays traditions. Number three, we have end of the day reunions that are generally special in our home. Number four, we see eye to eye about the role of TV in our home and watching TV and movies together. Number five, bedtimes are generally good times in our home for being close, for bedtime rituals. Number six, during weekends, we do a lot of things together that we enjoy and value. So we've created weekend rituals that we both appreciate. Seven, we have the same values about, values about entertaining people in our home. So rituals with friends coming over. Number eight, we both value or both dislike special celebrations like birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, family reunions. And we've, if we both like them, we've come up with ways to make those meaningful. Number nine, when one of us is sick, we both feel cared for. So we kind of have sick rituals, rituals for when we're sick that are meaningful. Number 10, we look forward to and enjoy our vacations and traveling together. That has become a meaningful ritual. 11, we have morning rituals that are very special to us. 12, when we do errands together, we generally enjoy it. So we've made that into a meaningful ritual. 13, we have ways of becoming renewed or refreshed when we're tired or burnt out. So we have rituals for just when we're exhausted that have become meaningful. So build meaningful rituals. Number two, 
Support each other's roles. So be in your core of the same beliefs and values around roles. So there's different roles, eight different roles, that basically we all fit into in adult life. So number one, we have similar values in our roles as parents. We're on the same page about what our roles are as parents. Number two, we are on the same page about what our roles are as spouses. What you do, what I do, how we work together. Number three, we have same beliefs about what it means to be a good friend to other people. Number four, we have similar values about what our role should be in taking care of our parents, in relating to our parents. Number five, we have similar views about work and our role as an employee for another company. So we're on the same page there. Number six, we have similar views, philosophies about balancing work and family. Number seven, we, my partner supports my basic mission in life. So part of my role is what I want to do, what I feel my purpose is to help the world, to help others. And so if we're both on the same page and agree with that, that is so important. And then we both have extended families that we still need to fill a role in relating to them. We're on the same page in agreeing about what that should look like. So then number th three, in building this core intimacy is shared goals. Being on the same page as far as the direction your life is going. And if you're both going in the same direction with similar goals, that adds to that core intimacy. So again, another questionnaire. We share many of the same goals. Number two, if I were to look back in my life, I would see that our paths have meshed very well. See, three, my partner values my accomplishments. Four, my partner honors the personal goals that I have that are unrelated to our marriage, so outside of family and marriage. Five, we share many of the same goals for others who are important to us, for our children, for our friends, for our community. Six, we have similar financial goals. Seven, our hopes and dreams or aspirations are quite compatible, but where you'd like to be in five years, 10 years. Eight, we, even when they're different, we have found a way to honor our life dreams. The final pillar, core beliefs and values. So again, a questionnaire. We see eye to eye about what home means. We're on the same page. Two, our philosophies about what love ought to be are the same. C, we have similar values about what peacefulness in our lives is all about. Four, we have similar values about the meaning of family. Five, the role of sex. Six, the importance and meaning of money in our lives. Then, the importance of education we share there. The importance of fun and play. The significance of adventure and travel to us. Trust. We both are on the same page in our thinking around trust. In our thinking around personal freedom. In our thinking around autonomy and independence. Sharing power in our relationship. We're on the same page being interdependent and what that looks like. The meaning of possessions, the meaning of nature and enjoying nature. Sentimentality, what do we do about things we feel sentimental about? Our kids' old clothes and all of those things, trophies, what do we do with that? We're on a similar page. What we want in retirement, spirituality. So what I hope you realize is the more things you share in common at those core values, the greater the intimacy in that deepest area of your life and the stronger the relationship. So have discussions around those things. 
Work to improve those things because it's that core spiritual intimacy that provides the backbone of a strong relationship. So that's our little mini-series around relationships. I hope it was helpful to you. That's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, and then I'm going to come back and do the Christian part, the spiritual part. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. We're not offended. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We've been doing a series on spiritual bypassing, and that's where we take spiritual teaching and use it to try to bypass the hard work of a healthy life, of recovery, try to bypass having to deal with or live with uncomfortable emotions, try to bypass the slow, messy process of growth and just get an instant magical fix and so we've been exploring some of the verses that get used, misused from the Bible that are used to try to say you can bypass these uncomfortable things. Today I want to come to 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person or a new creation. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And I've had so many people say to me, coming out of addiction or coming into trauma recovery, they use this verse and say, my old life's gone, it's all brand new. In other words, I don't have to deal with my past. I've got new life in Christ, which means it's a magical fix. Everything's going to be easy from here on out. I don't need to make hard decisions. I don't need to live with pain. It's all my old struggles are going to magically disappear because I've got a new nature and it's done. That is so sad when I hear that because it's the ultimate of spiritual bypass. It's the ultimate in magical thinking just to say, oh, I became a Christian, so I, don't, I won't struggle anymore. I don't have to deal with anything. Let me just show you what the rest of the Bible says. If you go through all the biographical sections of the Bible, all the stories of the saints that we look up to, you're going to find that every one of them struggled. Every one of them relapsed to old behaviors. So just because they had a new life didn't mean they still didn't have to deal with the old life. So look at Abraham. He struggled with sliding back into lying. Look at Moses, man, he struggled with going back to getting frustrated with these people and wanting to lash out. David, he struggled with neglecting his kids with sexual stuff for years. Elijah, he struggled with that depression and, and just wanting to give up. Paul, he talks about the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Oh, such a war inside of me. The heroes of our faith don't go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and say, see, I'm magically fixed. I'm not going to struggle anymore because I got a new, I'm a new creation in Christ. It's just not supported by the rest of the Bible. Then if you look at the, some of the metaphors of the Bible, Galatians 4, 19, it's about creating a new life. So what does Paul say? Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again and that they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your life. So what he is saying is you get a new life, but it's not a full-blown, mature life. It's a fetus. Then you go through the labor pains of that life coming, forming, and then coming out. And then that child has to grow and you go through the pains, the labor pains uh, as a parent of watching your child stumble and grow. It's the same with 
your life in Christ. Yes, you've got new life, but it's a fetus. Now you go through labor pains as you develop, as you change, as you fall on your knee. It's all part of growth. But there's labor pains. There's struggle. That's how growth happens in this new life. Then there's another metaphor that I love. It's all about sharpening. Proverbs 17, 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So you get a piece of metal and you want to make it into a sharp knife. What do you have to do? You take it to a blacksmith. They hammer it out. They, they put it on the anvil. Or you put it on a whetstone and grind it. Or you use iron to sharpen iron. There's pain, there's sparks, there's heat. There's resistance from the metal. And what he is saying is you're, you're smoothing out rough edges. It takes work, it takes pain. No piece of metal wants to go through that. But that's how you get a sharp knife. How do you get a sharp, healthy personality person? They need this sharpening effect of other people. Iron sharpening iron. It's not, I've got a new life, I'm okay. No, there's the sharpening process. And then, the creation of a pearl. How does that happen? Well, you get an oyster, and it gets a tiny little piece of sand that gets inside of it. It's an irritant. And then it secretes what is called nacre. And that nacre goes around the irritant, and that's what becomes the beautiful, priceless pearl. But the point is this. You don't get a pearl by saying, oh, magical, new life, pearl. No, you get an irritant. You struggle with that irritant. You deal with that irritant. And eventually it becomes a pearl. And so the Bible is saying growth towards beauty is always a process, number one. And number two, it's a process that always has painful elements. Childbirth, labor pains, iron sharpening iron, formation of a pearl from an irritant. And then go to creation of a diamond. Did you realize that diamonds are created about a hundred miles below the Earth's surface. And that piece of coal is what it started out at. It had to be put under about a million pounds of pressure, heated to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and kept in that intense, hot place for about a million years. As that happened, the molecules within that structure of coal changed and became a diamond. So how does a coal, piece of coal change to a priceless diamond? Intense pressure and heat. Intense stress. That's the process. And then finally, refining gold, refining silver. First Peter says... Be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. And then Malachi 3 says this, He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. So the point is this, you take a metal that's mixed in purity, you put it under intense fire, the metal melts, and as it melts, all the impurities come to the surface as dross. You scrape away the impurities, the dross, but you keep the fire on, and then other impurities come, you scrape those away, you keep the fire on until you end up with 99.9% .9 pure. But it's a heating process. It's a painful process. So don't use 2 Corinthians 5.17 to say, 
I'm a new creature, I won't struggle. No, that's not how God works. God, in every example in the Bible, says, I want growth for you. But growth is going to involve fire, pain, stress, pressure, iron sharpening iron, labor pains. It's a process that always is difficult. I hope that helps. Let's pray. God, thank you for the balancing parts of your word that clear up any of those areas that we might try to make magical, that we might try to bypass, use to bypass. And I just pray that you would help people to accept that your path is not pain-free. Your path is not magical, quick, easy. Your path is slow. And you do that on purpose. It keeps us close to you. And help us just to accept that. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you so much for...